Well, new details are emerging about the government's plan to wind down mortgage giants Fannie and Freddie, a decision that could impact investors large and small. Kate Kelly is here with the very latest. Kate. Thanks so much, Scott. So a bipartisan proposal came out of Washington yesterday that could effectively end Fannie and Freddie as we know them, replacing the housing insurers with a new set of federal agencies that would put the private sector on the hook first if the loans started to collapse. This was bad news for Wall Street, where the thinly traded common stocks of the two names and their preferred shares have been hedge fund darlings, as well as, in some cases, day trader darlings in recent years. Pershing Square's Bill Ackman, the largest investor in both Fannie and Freddie common shares, and Bruce Berkowitz, who runs the Fairholme Mutual Funds and is their second biggest holder, took enormous hits just yesterday on these double-digit percentage declines. The impact on the preferred shares, at least initially, to this Senate proposal, um, and these are held in large size by Perry Capital, and Paulson and Company, as well as others, was far less. The preferreds were much flatter yesterday. Perry and Fairholme have sued the U.S. government in separate cases, charging essentially that their handling of Fannie and Freddie has been unlawful. They argue also that the government's backing of the U.S. mortgage system is more essential than ever. Whether they'll prevail under this new political pressure, Scott, remains to be seen. There is a lot of doubt as to whether this proposal can really get the votes needed. It still remains a controversial issue. Kate, thanks. Stick with us. Let's ask a man who knows a little bit about this. We do have opinions on both sides of this controversial topic. Senator Mark Warner co-authored the original bill that calls for winding down the GSEs. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader owns shares in Fannie and Freddie Common Stock. We're going to hear from him in just a moment. But first, let's bring in the senator. Senator, good to have you on the Halftime Show. Hey, Scott, thanks for having me on. Why not let uh, Fannie and Freddie recapitalize and, and recover? Well, Scott, let's, let's step back for a second. You know, four or five years ago, these entities were going down the tubes. The taxpayer stepped in for $188 billion. Uh, yes, they've recovered, but we had a system that was not just sustainable. We were unsure whether there was an explicit government guarantee. The guarantee was at the entity, not at the securities. You had private shareholder gain, but when stuff hits the fan, taxpayer losses, that is not a sustainable system. And you've got many in Congress who want to get the government completely out of the housing marketplace that would completely destroy the 30-year fixed and cause great disruption. We come with a bipartisan proposal. We started with 10 senators, 5 Ds, 5 Rs. Now we've got the, the chair and the ranking member who've accepted the framework we've laid out. We've had 10 separate hearings on this. Everybody from the actual housing industry has roughly on a 1 to 10 scale given our proposal an 8 to 9. And we heard nothing in the 10 hearings we had on this subject that didn't say we were headed in the right direction. Yes, we say there ought to be more private capital up front. We maintain the 30-year fix because there is an explicit government guarantee. We maintain the uh, funding for first-time home buyers and low-income home buyers with a defined auditable system. Right. You know, I think this is something that actually we may surprise some folks. This is common sense. Let's get this last piece of the financial reform system in place. Right. And yes, I understand that there's been some volatility in the market. I would remind the viewers, though, these shares, since the, they were basically worthless, have gone up, I think, 1,600 percent on, on something that is going to be litigated in the court. Sure. They took a hit yesterday, but most of the folks who invested early are still looking at massive profits. They, and they there are, was a, but then, they, they would make the argument with respect, Senator, that there, there are more profits uh, likely to be made if, if these things are allowed to be re recapitalized. I, I, I Scott, should tell you, uh, let, Scott, let, let me I mean, finish, if, if you don't okay. mind, Senator, let me, let me just, yeah, sure. let, me, let me make another point. Um, sure. Ralph Nader is going to follow you. And he would say, uh, what's the difference between Fannie, Freddie, AIG, and Citi? Uh, they were allowed to get back. They were bailed out. They were allowed to get back on their feet. Shareholders were allowed to reap the rewards of the recovery of those types of entities. So why not in this case? Well, Scott, unlike the others, we ended up having to back those. And hopefully what we've done in Dodd-Frank is make sure that we've got a resolution ability to never do that again. The difference in Fannie and Freddie is you got that government guarantee. You know, what I don't hear from some of the critics who are, I understand they've got a financial interest that they want to make money on. That's American capitalism. Have at it. Go at that litigation. But you've got an explicit government guarantee. Are you going to continue a system that has private shareholder gain and public shareholder loss when, when we go through a dip? Are these new entities going to be recapitalized at, uh, as for-profit entities, not-for-profit entities? Are they going to be the securitization done and, and the backstop at the entity level, at the security level? And quite honestly, I think the system that was set up with this kind of quasi-duopoly 
was flawed from the outset. I, I, it was remarkable it lasted as long as it did. These guys, from Mr. Nader to the hedge fund guys, they ought to have their day in court. There's a real question about the, the Treasury sweeping of all, all the profits. Sure, and that I mean, makes let me... Uh, to, to that your, would be a day in court. But to your, from to a your policy point. perspective, from a policy perspective, anybody that thinks that the status quo is viable when you've got enormous pressures to completely move the government out of housing, I think doesn't have a, a, a connection to the, the policy and political reality we live with right to, now. To your point, Senator, uh, Bruce Berkowitz of, of Fairholme is, is one of the hedge fund right. uh, investors. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with him and, and his proposal here. Uh, he sends a statement uh, to me that says the following, and I'd like your reaction to it if you, if you would uh, uh, oblige. What sure. happened before 2008 was the result of regulatory and management failures accelerated by political meddling, he says. These failures continue today with the unlawful depletion of the entity's capital in conservatorship. Privately owned Fannie and Freddie are irreplaceable. All the sincere effort expended by the Senate Banking Committee simply confirms that there is no better alternative. Your response? I think he has obviously not followed the 10 hearings that, with the exception, I believe, of his testimony, uniformly thought the framework in Corker Warner was the right way to go. Let's put more private capital at risk. Let's make sure we are explicit about the government backstop. Let's charge for it in a way. Let's make sure we've got the public policy goals rather than the kind of nebulous approach we've got right now. And I understand why folks don't want to change the status quo. The folks who've got this, the current status quo, we have no, virtually no private capital. It's a totally socialized government-supported system. Sure, but we the, the hedge funds are making the argument that, that, that uh, a system with private Good. capital on the hook, uh, in part theirs, uh, is well, listen, the way to go. Maybe the first 10 to 12% well, of and, losses and, would be absorbed by the right, investors right. themselves. And, uh, Scott, actually, that I'm glad you raised that point because that's exactly what we say. Private capital needs to be, does a much better job than the government of pricing both interest rate risk and credit risk. Let's let Bruce and the others set up these, in effect, bond guarantors, 10% private capital, first dollar loss, before we hit the FDIC type reinsurance fund. Yeah, they got a role to play in a new system, but in a system right now where there's only private side upside and downside is absorbed by the public is, um, you know, I don't think passes the smell test. I'd also say for those who say, well, look, Fannie and Freddie's made the money back. I was in the venture capital business a lot longer than I've been an elected official. If I put 188 billion bucks to work in the bottom of the crisis, I got to tell you, as an investor, I'd want more than a one-to-one -one return. Yeah, well, I know now, that. What beyond that? What beyond that will be obviously Bruce and the others will have a case in, in front of the courts. That ought to be that ought to be litigated. They'll have their day in court. But that should not slow the reform of a of a current policy that everybody across the industry knows and believes is right. unsustainable. Right. No, look, I, I know and I hear from these, these shareholders who say, uh, you know, they're willing to provide the new capital uh, to a private market so solution if, if they're uh, allowed to do so. Let me, I got to run, and, Senator. And but, let but Scott, that is what our bill does. I, I, I actually believe that these guys ought to read the bill. I know. Let, let me ask you quickly, and this is my last sure. question. I really got to run. Can yeah. this pass Congress, yes or no? I think it will. Because if there's ever a chance when you got bipartisan support, wide-based industry and advocate support, if not, this system's more broken than I thought. Senator, thanks so much for spending time with us today. Important thanks, topic. Scott. I really appreciate your time. All righty. All right. Let's get reaction now uh, to this from Ralph Nader. He is a longtime consumer advocate. He actually uh, owns both of these stocks. He's also the author of the new book, Unstoppable. Mr. Nader, thanks for coming on. Thank you. I presume that you've heard the, the senator here. Uh, what's your reaction? Well, first of all, we haven't seen the real bill uh, of the Johnson Crapo uh, press release, so we don't know the, all the details. Uh, from what we do know, a lot of the reforms can be done uh, with the existing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac structure. Uh, the, the, the two companies are making a lot of money. They exude stability for the real estate industry. Uh, they are projected to make a lot of money. They know how to do their business, and they can be reformed into a public utility uh, model uh, and still protect the shareholders. I don't think this bill's going anywhere because unless the powerful real estate lobby and the housing lobby uh, back it, it's dead in the water. You haven't joined the, the lawsuit of some of the other large shareholders, have you? No, I haven't. Why not? Because they're carrying the weight on this and they're paying their lawyers, so it, it would just be redundant. But I do know one thing, <clears throat> that there are too many unknowns when you unravel uh, the uh, bulwark behind the housing industry, Fannie and Freddie. Too many unknowns means to the business community instability. It means insecurity. 
it means they don't know what's going to work, who the players are going to be. In the meantime, Fannie and Freddie are churning it out. They're meeting the needs. They've got an affordable housing mandate, which is very important and which is very speculative in what Senator Warner's proposal involves. And there's a chance for the shareholders to recover after being deceived in 2008 by Bernanke, Paulson, and the regulator, who told them in the summer of 2008 to the shareholders, don't worry, everything is okay, uh, Fannie and Freddie are capitalized. The taxpayer will be fully reimbursed with profit, and if the, the, other, uh, uh, the other factor is if the shareholders don't get the future profits from Fannie and Freddie, then the people who want to reduce the federal deficit will be supportive of Fannie and Freddie because they're projected to earn by the uh, – uh, government uh, by the CBO, $180 billion in the next 10 years. So you know, you know, it's going nowhere in the, in the Congress. Mr. Nader, it's Kate Kelly here. I thought uh, Senator Warner said something interesting. He sort of threw a bone to the Fair Homes and the Perry Capitals and some of these other preferred investors and perhaps common investors like yourself as well, saying there is a legal issue, a real one, dealing with the sweep amendment of 2012 and whether or not that was lawful and that ought to cycle through the courts. Did that notion surprise you coming from him? Well, it showed that he recognized the equity of the long-term shareholders of Fannie and Freddie, who were told it's the safest investment uh, after treasuries. But what he, what he didn't say is the following. If they dismantle and replace Fannie and Freddie, how are the, how are the courts going to rule when the, the, the giver of equity to the shareholders is disappearing? So it so becomes essentially a, that, that's a why point. Nothing's going to happen until after 2016. Yeah. It's too hot for the politicians, the people back home, the real estate agents, and all the powerful forces. They, they know what Freddie and Fannie can do. It's, they're doing it. They're making a profit. There's stability. They're not going to rock the boat. It's not going to go anywhere in Congress. Mr. Nader, um, and you own 50,000 shares of, of each or, or combined here? Yeah, each. Okay. Uh, well, you got a, you got a, a lot at stake, uh, as do a lot of other investors uh, as well. We appreciate you coming on and sharing your views with us here on the Halftime Show. Yeah, those are long-time holdings before 2008. That's why the deception factor is so important. Understood. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. All right, we'll talk to you again soon. Up next, is the market's hottest sector in a bubble? Biotech is up more than 30% over the past three months, but find out why one of our traders is starting to see cracks. Then it's been five years since Bernie Madoff pled guilty. We've hopefully learned a lot since then, and we'll identify the four financial fraud red flags you need to watch out for. And it's hard to believe that today the Internet turns 25. So as we go to break, take a look at what else was happening in 89. More half is straight ahead.